Who knows this verse? Devi hi shaguna mahi. If you know this verse, please raise your hand. Raise means going like this. I can't see. You have to put it up. All right. Well, all devotees should know this verse. Of course, I mean, learning it, we say we know it, but of course, to really know it, if we really knew it, then we'd really follow it. Two, in this verse, two colossally important points are made. One is that maya is very difficult to overcome. We all have experience of this. Maya is very difficult to overcome. Who would, who would corroborate that by their personal experience? Uh, well, it, it, agree, you would say, simply. The little boy is not putting his hand up. He's not experienced. <laughs> then the other point that one who surrenders to Krishna can easily cross beyond it. Maya seems almost impossible to overcome. But there is actually only one means, and that is to surrender to Krishna. And then we can easily cross over Maya. But then we'll say that, well, it's not easy to surrender to Krishna because we're in Maya. So it seems like we're, we're caught in an impossible situation. It, it sounds like uh, inside the cage is miserable and outside is good. So that may sound all right, but you say, yeah, but I'm inside the cage and it's locked up. How, how to go out? When we hear this, we might think, okay, I'll surrender to Krishna. But then we find out that it's not so easy to surrender. Srila Prabhupada often said that we can surrender to Krishna in a moment, but we don't do so due to our attachment to Maya. So, how to surrender to Krishna? Well, there is a process of surrender by which we can gradually become free. Our surrender begins with the uh, with the vow or the determination, the uh, what's the word? Sankalpa? Where's Gadadha? What's the word for Sankalpa? Determination, vow, something like that. With the, uh, with the taking the decision that now I will follow the path of Krishna consciousness. The process, actually, we find Bhagavad Gita. Chapter 18, text 66 is another well-known verse of Bhagavad Gita. In this verse we read today, Lord Krishna says, Mam eva ye prapadyante. He refers to those who prapadyante, they surrender to me. Uh, we find the word surrender coming in another important verse of Bhagavad Gita. When Lord Krishna says, Mam e kam sharanam raja. Srila Prabhupada translates this as surrender unto me. Now there are different verbs here. One is, well, the, on, on two different words. One is prapadyante, prapati, surrender. And sharan means, it actually means shelter. So sharanam raja, go to my shelter. So that, it's taking shelter, that means to surrender to Krishna. To be protected by Krishna, we have to take shelter of Krishna. Just like in the modern age, um, there's the idea of women's liberation. Women should be free to do whatever they like. But there's also in traditional culture in the West, and also, uh, and very strongly in traditional Vedic culture, that women should be protected. But you can't have both. You can't have independence and protection. If you think, uh, I'll go out alone at night, and well, well, then how can you be protected? You have to, to be sheltered, you have to be subservient. You have to surrender your independence. So one cannot be independent of Krishna and at the same time be sheltered by him. So to take shelter of Krishna means to follow his instructions. Then one is, sur that is surrender to him. Then one is protected by him. So the process of taking shelter for those who are in Maya, that is known as Sharanagati. The way of, of, of coming to shelter, coming to the shelter. So we can surrender to Krishna by following the process of Bhakti Yoga by following the rules and regulations of devotional service, 
we come under the protection of Krishna. Mahatmanas to Mang Parta Parta Daiving Prakritim Ashitaha. The Mahatmas, the great souls, they are within the shelter. That's another word. Ashray, Ashrita. They are sheltered by the uh, Prakriti, the Krishna's divine energy. Mm. So we take shelter of Krishna by following these rules and regulations of devotional service. Now, it's not that maya becomes weaker when we take to bhakti. Maya remains strong, but by taking shelter of Krishna, who is stronger, we remain protected. An example is given that in the raging, flooding river, great elephants may be washed away, but the little fish can swim against the current because it has taken shelter of the river, of the water. Similarly, the great yogi Durvasa Muni, highly accomplished in uh, all the yoga siddhis, he was in Maya. He was concerned with his own prestige and he had some grudge against Ambarish Maharaj for no reason. But Ambarish Maharaj, who didn't practice mystic yoga, he was simply a devotee. But he was protect. He was not in Maya. He wasn't concerned with prestige or any such thing. He was protected directly by Krishna. So Durvasa Muni, who was such a highly reputed yogi, he looked like a great fool, actually. We offer our respects to him. He has a great personality. But in this instance, he was running all over the universe afraid of death, whereas a yogi is supposed to be fearless. So we see that even if one is highly accomplished in yoga, or for that matter even considered highly advanced in bhakti, maya can make you into a clown at any moment. We see, we've seen many times that devotees who appear to be very advanced and then something happens, they change. We should never underestimate the power of Maya. Maya never relaxes. If we think, well, now I'm advanced, I can relax, <coughs> then Maya will say, hello. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time, but I'm, we're still friends, aren't we? <laughs> we don't know how powerful Maya is. It's a, it's a great miscalculation to think that I have overcome Maya. Because we cannot overcome Maya. Maya is much stronger than us. We can only take shelter at the lotus feet of Krishna. And he can carry us over Maya. By our own endeavor, we cannot cross over Maya. And so many uh, subtle ways of acting Maya has. If we think, I'll be very, I'll, I'll do very humble service, and then we start to be proud that I'm doing humble. I, I'm, I'm so humble. I'm the most humble. No one's more humble than me. <laughs> Outside we're showing great humility and inside we're thinking, I'm so humble. See, I'm much more humble than all of them. I'm the best. Maya is grabbing us again. This uh, Kala Krishna Das, he had the direct association of Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He was traveling alone with him. And so he had so much direct association. But then some gypsies came to him and said, Hey, we got some good girls. Want to try it out? Okay, great. How is that possible? Well, um, I believe it was Bhaktisthan Sarasvati Thakur analyzed that he was serving Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, but he neglected to hear from him. There must be some fault somewhere. You don't just, it's not just some kind of Russian roulette where someone just by chance gets shot. If someone falls down, there's some reason. Then negligence in devotional... Yeah, there's some reason. It's God to that. Someone thinks, well, I'm so advanced, I don't have to chant my rounds. Or uh, there's so many we may neglect. I, I can do this, I can do that. Break the rules. We uh, make offenses to devotees. We're, we don't endeavor, we're not attentive in our sadhana. 
Even sometimes we may, I, we've seen devotees who they want to stand up for the right cause, but they become so, in, they, they, there are discrepancies in the movement and they want to correct it, and the, the, what they're saying is correct, but they become so much overwhelmed with this that they forget to properly hear and chant about Krishna, and they fall down. You see that the devotees, they come to devotional service, they become, They've had some experience or realization of how miserable the material energy is. And they come to take shelter at Krishna's lotus feet and find relief there. But sometimes it happens even after many years of practicing devotional service, they become attracted to the glitter maya. And we see devotees like this, even though they know, but you can't say anything to them. They know what's, I mean, they theoretically they know the philosophy, but you can't, you can't tell it to them, they can't hear. They become closed off, they, they, they can't hear from anyone. They become reckless. No, uh, reckless means uh, they have no care. Oh. There's uh, no complete mm. lack of caution. Mm. It's something like driving, you know, at 180 mm. kilometers an hour without looking you know, without even properly looking at the road. Mm. With with vastly overconfident, that, yeah, I, I can do it, all right. And uh, grossly overestimate their own strength and underestimate that of Maya. So we can see that, uh, it, 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 sometimes you see this in the world, it's like a diseased condition. They're like, like flies rushing into the fire. It doesn't make any sense why a fly should enter the fire. But they're attracted by the light. It seems so attractive that it will burn them, that it will kill them. They don't... They're just the, the attraction is so strong that they don't even care. So Maya is like that. People will smoke cigarettes. They know that it's a cause of uh, fatal diseases, but still. Uh, what to speak of uh, cigarettes, even this... Uh, narcotic drugs like heroin, people know that you do this and you'll soon be like this. But that thrill they are attracted to, they don't have the, the, the their desire for sense gratification totally overcomes their intelligence. So Maya is like that. Maya doesn't work. Maya, it's not that we can just by our intelligence overcome Maya. She totally sabotages the intelligence. Well, you can just say destroys. And they're, they're about, sabotage gives the idea of, a, of the idea of um, it's like a terrorist act or something like that. No, I can say that you say what I want to something may not understand what it means. This word in Russian. Yeah, same word. Mind and the intelligence is the same word in Russian. Mm. Mm. So what to do? How to remain safe? If we hear all this, we should become very afraid. And now I'm uh, uh, trying to go forward in bhakti, but Maya can just come in like some virus, like a, you know, like cancer. You know, one day you go to the doctor and say, "I got this pain, and it just won't go away." And say, "Well, you got cancer. You'll be dead in two, in two weeks." It's nice knowing you. See you later. <laughs> Actually, the doctors don't say that. They say, "No, no." We'll give you some treatment, it'll only cost you all your life savings. And they'll, they'll get all the money out of you, and then they'll let you die. <laughs> so what to do? We should be afraid. How can we be free from Maya? Well, that's the answer. Be afraid. Recently I met one godbrother who told me, he, well, he asked me, how is it you've maintained sannyas all these years? So I thought about it and I gave some answer. Uh, the conclusion is that the mercy of Srila Prabhupada, which is absolutely a fact. But I'm not going to explore that now. I'm going to go to onto what he said because we're talking about fear of Maya. So uh, he told me, I asked different sannyasis this. And Jayadvaita Swami gave the reply because I'm scared to hell of Maya. A devotee is free from fear. Vajahure mana shinanda nandana abhaya charana ravindare. 
devotee is free from fear because he's situated at the fearless lotus feet of Krishna. But how is that being situated at the lotus feet of Krishna? Because bhaja hure mana shinanda nandana. Because sabai mana Krishna padara vindhyaho. The mind is placed at the lotus feet of Krishna. As soon as we think we don't need Krishna's protection or we can we can do without Krishna's protection, we lose it. Once Srila Prabhupada told a group of his disciples that any one of you can fall down any time, I cannot fall down. Then a few days later, or maybe the next day, uh, one, one of the devotees who was, in, who was in that group saw Srila Prabhupada very fervently praying to the deities. So he was bold enough to ask Prabhupada that what he was praying. And he said, I was praying to Krishna that I never fall down. And the devotee said, but Prabhupada, you told us you could never fall down. Prabhupada said, because I am always praying that I never fall down, therefore I can never fall down. Prārtana karoi shada narotama das. We find the rotam das. He gives the last line of several songs that I'm always praying. Rupa Raghunata Pade Jara Ash Chaitanya Charitamrita Kari Krishna Das. It's, uh, similarly, Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami finishes almost every chapter of Chaitanya Charitamrita by declaring his uh, Asha, his, his desire to be situated at the lotus feet of Rupa and Raghunath, to take shelter of their lotus feet. We can get shelter by praying for it and acting in a manner that is suitable for taking that shelter. You may say, well, I won't bother following the rules very strictly, but Krishna will protect. It doesn't work like that. Krishna is protecting us by giving us the rules and regulations. If we follow, we are protected. If we don't follow, we go outside the protection. These rules and regulations are not arbitrary. All the rules and regulations are meant to uh, help us be absorbed in Krishna consciousness. Just have your mind saying, well, I can eat some kami bread. It doesn't really matter. It's just some bread, that's all. Probably vegetarian. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, Bishayir on the kaile dushta. That by eating grains, given uh, uh, the grains of materialistic people, then the mind becomes contaminated. We, we go outside the system that we take only Krishna Prasad. So we can't expect that if we, like this, we, we break all the rules and we'll have the same purified consciousness of those who do follow the rules. Now, for pre it's said that for preaching you can do anything. So if to preach you have to break some rules, then there's some special protection. But even then, we shouldn't think, well, I got special protection, so I can do whatever I like. That attitude will mean that we go outside the protection. Just like the story is there of Sita Devi going outside the Lakshman record. The line was drawn by Lakshman. Don't go outside this line. She went outside. She went. She was kidnapped. Now, even if we follow the rules and regulations, but still... <coughs> Uh, if we don't endeavor to control the mind or if we make offenses to Vaishnavas, still we can fall down. No doubt it is a struggle in this difficult material world to follow the process of Bhakti Yoga. But by doing so, Krishna beca if we do so, then Krishna becomes pleased. This, uh, this struggle makes us strong. Just like uh, how can a man become strong? By lifting weights. It's a struggle, but he, he becomes strong by doing so. Now, many times we may think that, well, if there was a more ideal situation, then I could practice Krishna consciousness better. But actually, often we find that when the difficulty is removed, then the struggle is removed, and the devotees, they, they actually they become less enthusiastic to serve Krishna. During the communist regime here in Russia, it was very difficult to practice Krishna consciousness. One had to be extremely committed even to be a devotee. And devotees were thinking, well, if we could just, if we could have a more conducive situation, then we could practice much better. But then it was found that when the situation did become more conducive, 
that the devotee, at least this was told to me by several devotees from that era, that the, the devotees, they became less serious, actually. So we may think that, well, why is Krishna allowing Maya to give me so many difficulties? If I didn't have this grumpy wife or this nasty husband, then I could practice Krishna consciousness much better. Or if I didn't have this problem or that problem, or there's millions of problems. Maya has got a, a big box full of problems, and she's always making more new ones. Maya is very creative. She's always creating fantastically uh, complex situations to entangle us more and more. We spend, uh, we're trying to overcome the problems, but in doing so, we create more. And we think that, well, just if I could have this nice situation, then I'd be very peaceful, and then I could chant Hare Krishna very nicely. But we don't know what, what Maya is, what test she will give. So, uh, devotee, he, instead of seeing that there's a, there's a certain perspective that a devotee adopts, then even in the midst of great difficulties, he can make tremendous spiritual advancement. Instead of thinking of the difficulties as the reason why I can't become Krishna conscious, he sees that they are the means to become Krishna. He may think, well, I'd, I'd really like to be Krishna conscious, but I've got bad health and my family members are against it and I've got, there's so many problems and but I'm, it's just the situation is too difficult. I'd like to be Krishna conscious, but the whole situation is against me. Instead of thinking like that, if we think that, well, I'll, I'll practice my Krishna consciousness despite the situation, I'll do it the best I can in this circumstance. And Krishna will appreciate that sincere endeavor. There is one verse in this regard that Srila Prabhupada says, should be the guide of all devotees. Tatenu kampan su samikshamarano Bhunjana evatna kritam viparakam vidvagva pubhye vidadhan namaste jiveta yo muktipade saddhaya bhag which means that one who prays to the Lord that uh, despite uh, I, mm, uh, let's go back to the beginning of the verse that uh, one who is in all difficulties and but instead of blaming his luck, he thinks that this is due to my previous sinful activities. And in the midst of all difficulties, he remains uh, calm and goes on serving Krishna the best he can with mind, body and words, always expecting the mercy of Krishna, praying for that mercy, that my dear Lord, I am very sinful, therefore I have all these problems. Therefore, I have all these problems. One who has such an attitude is certain to go back to God. It becomes practically his right. So, uh, it's a matter of attitude. Instead of blaming the situation that I can't become Krishna conscious, you think that, well, I, man is the architect of his own fortune. I, because of my activities in previous lives or in this life, I've, I'm in this situation. Actually, it's a fact that in, in various Shastras there are lists of certain sins you perform and certain effects that you get. If you see someone who's uh, got one leg longer than the other, there's some reason. I don't know exactly, but it's something like they may have kicked a cow or a brahmin or something like that. It's connected. So there is a great chain of sinful reactions. Aprarabdha falang pavam kutam bijam falong falong mukham What is that? Kramene kramene naiva praliyate aghantum vanti katsena Is it? Kramene naiva praliyate That's it. Is it? I'm getting mixed up. Anyway, this described in the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, there's a great chain of sinful reaction. There's the desire, the, the, the deep in the heart desire for uh, sinful life. And from that, from that stock of of si of the sinful attitude, <clears throat> from time to time, some sinful desire pops up, like the like the bubble 
pops up from the bottom of a lake. And then, then the desire to, the, the desire becomes manifest. And then one commits a sinful activity. We see a Jamil, he, mm. he was very pure, he had no bad thoughts. But by seeing two people engaged in grossly sinful activity, he became attracted to them. He became attracted to also mm. do like that. Why is that? Because even though in this life he had not experienced any such sinful desire, but the sinful desire was deeply dormant within his heart. So these, uh, you may think, you know, what hope is there for us then? Because, you know, any time these desires can come and overwhelm us, because maya is very strong. The hope is, mameva ye prapadyante maya metam tarantite. By surrendering to Krishna, we can cross over all difficulties. So many difficulties will come. We have to stick to the process of Krishna consciousness. Krishna will appreciate that. Krishna will help us. We have to maintain our faith in all circumstances. Krishna will help us. Krishna helps us by giving us the process of devotional service. And Krishna helps us by giving us the association of devotees. Krishna is willing to help us. But we have to be willing to take his help. That is the meaning of surrender. Surrender means to be willing to take Krishna's help without which we are helpless. And surrender means we have to be willing to take Krishna's help on Krishna's terms and conditions. Not that we'll invent our own terms and, well, I'll, I'll surrender, but on, on, in my own way. Mm -hmm. That's, there's no own way, there's Krishna's way. We are the servant, he is the master. Are there any questions about this? I can pass the mic. We're always being tested by Maya at every moment. Maya is always saying, oh. it's when we start to listen that we, that we are in danger. Suddenly we stay. The devotee looks at the material world and he sees that there is a vast ocean of forgetfulness of Krishna. We can look out of the window and see these apartments and visualize within the apartment so many people spoiling their lives by forgetting Krishna. We can also look, we could also look and think that, well, there are so many people, they're, they're enjoying themselves in a way that I'm not. They don't have to get up early in the morning. They don't have all these rules about eating. They can eat whatever they like. You know, they have their friends. They go and they're, they're drinking friends. So, it's a, we see the same thing, but we, with a different outlook. One is, one outlook is, Sevanmuk, Krishna Sevanmuk, with the desire to serve Krishna, and the other is Bahirmuk, looking away from Krishna. Yeah, give the mic. Yeah, by following the process, that that is taking shelter. Although we should be hesitant to call ourselves a devotee, better to say that we are we are taking shelter of Krishna's devotees. A devotee is an exalted position. Uh, conventionally, we we say, I am a devotee. And conven from the conventional perspective, we may be a devotee. What could we say? I'm a devotee. I follow the rules and regulations, but my mind isn't. Bhajahure mana srinanda nandana. First, we should decide to follow the principles, and then the next thing is to bring the mind into into the same course. Okay, there's a question. Sadashi had a question. Okay, pass the mic back there. In the meantime, give him that. Put, put this mic back there. Okay, you, now you ask your question. <laughs> well, quote the shlok. You'll get the answer in the shlok. What does that mean? There you go, there's your answer. We also have yeyata maam prapadyante tans tataiva pajami So that consideration is there also. Krishna reciprocates according to our degree of surrender. If one can see in envy and greed in others, does it mean that he himself has this quality? Yeah, it's not really on the subject out there. And he already has. This question was asked during the question and answer session. Yeah, but I didn't answer it because of it. Yeah, this is a good question. How to apply all this practically? Well, um, we may try to rectify 
an unfavorable situation if the rectification doesn't create another unfavorable situation. For instance, we may have some health difficulty which impedes our service, but then the, the, the treatment is, the treatment may be so heavy and so expensive and so time consuming and so uncertain that we may decide, well, better to go on with the, uh, with the health problem. Or if it's, if it's something simple, then we, then we could uh, take the medication or whatever. There's one devotee I know, and there may be many more, who if he regularly takes some medication, acts in a manner that might be called normal. And if he doesn't take it, he acts like highly abnormal. So it was uh, once he didn't take his medicine and then he stopped taking his medicine and then he was fully convinced, he was telling everyone that the earth is about to be invaded by aliens and the devotees knew, oh, he didn't take his pills. So one has to take a decision. Just like uh, every year, Pantsatapa Prabhu asked that, well, I'm in a town where there's not much association. Should I move somewhere else? So there are pros and cons in every decision. There's no guarantee that if you move that you'll be in a better situation. Theoretically, it might be. But it might be, somehow or other, it might be much worse also. So considering the uncertainty of moving, uh, uh, the uncertainty of actually getting a better situation, the tremendous endeavor and psychological uprooting, just like a plant is uprooted and it's, it's shocking, that's another consideration. And that the present situation isn't so bad after all. I mean, you might think it could be better, but it's not so bad. You could also consider that, well, maybe I'm in this situation, Krishna has some reason for me being in this situation, so let me try to do something to serve Krishna in this situation. So there are so many decisions to be made in life. Um, and decision means that the more decisions you make, the more mistakes you'll make, because you can never tell what's going to happen in future exactly. Hitler was a brilliant general, but he should have learned from Napoleon's mistake not to attack Russia. But he got overconfident. He was smashing you know, Denmark, Norway, and even France and Poland, which are big countries. Which are big countries. Poland. So he got overconfident. So the only thing history teaches us is that we never learn from history. Uh, therefore, in making decisions, it's wise to consult others. But we can't expect others to make decisions for us. In some cases, yes, the, the child is, decisions are made for the child by the parents, but uh, some level of personal responsibility is required in adults. Actually, the modern idea is that we should all have freedom, but modern society gives too much freedom. In uh, Vedic society recognizes that the majority of the population are shudras, which means they're not very responsible. They don't, they're not, they don't, know what's best for them. Therefore, they should be kept under control. And most people would be better, and now we're talking on the material platform, if they were just employed and they were taken care of and they didn't have to you know, make so many different life decisions for themselves. In traditional cultures, people don't choose their own spouse because they're considered too immature and irresponsible to do so. They find so many people, they just don't know what to do. And then even they ask people's advice, and but they still don't, they remain undecided. Such people should, they require that you do this, you do this, you do this. But in the modern life, they're not obliged to. So even if you tell them, they won't follow, and they remain their whole life hanging in the air. This question, if you see greed and envy in others, is it because it's in yourself? Well, maybe the person who's asking the question can give the answer himself. There's a theory that if you ever see any fault in others, it means actually it's in yourself. But that's not necessarily true. That's just some kind of psychological theory that, to have some kind of utopian idea that no one should criticize anyone else.
So then, don't be judgmental. This is said, you shouldn't judge anyone. And then, you know, the murderer is brought to the court and the judge says, well, I don't want to judge you. Actually, this insane idea that we shouldn't judge anyone has overtaken the judge courts in the Western countries. So that uh, you can literally get away with murder by saying that, you know, actually I had a, I had a rough childhood and so I'm psychologically disturbed. In England, one woman, she, she fed her husband sedatives, then she sharpened the, the uh, kitchen knife and slit his throat and killed him. And in the court she said, well, he was always beating me. There's no evidence of that. The neighbors had never heard any sounds like that. His previous wife, because he was divorced, uh, said, well, he, ne he never beat me. But she pleaded that, you know, I was, you know, I was so disturbed from him beating me and she got away. So this absurd idea that you should not judge anyone, it's, it's then, then we're just animals, there's, if there's no discrimination. Of course, we should know our position also. It's, we, we should work more on our own purification than trying to purify everyone else. But we have to discriminate between good association and bad association. Sometimes junior devotees are bewildered because they don't know how to discriminate between good association and bad association. Someone who is a senior devotee, they've been initiated for 20 years, a Brahmin initiated, and they say, well, you don't have to follow very much. You, you, you can watch TV as much as you like, and you, know, you don't have to chant all your rounds if you don't feel like it. And they say, well, he's very senior, he must be right. But uh, one who can understand clearly knows that he's talking nonsense, he's in Maya. And because he's envious of you, he wants you to be in Maya also. He doesn't want that you should practice Krishna consciousness nicely. That means he's envious. Now let's be clear about it. And instead of saying, you know, oh, he's very senior, very one, maybe senior may have done good service in the past, and we can respect that. If he's, but nonsense is nonsense. Whoever says it, no one has a license to talk nonsense. Even if you're a guru, you just can't say whatever you like. In fact, even in fact, the qualification to be a guru is that you only speak according to Guru Sadhu and Shastra. So, there's guru by institutional uh, appointment. One may be a guru by institutional appointment. Mm. An, an institution needs some kind of system, and the system can never be perfect. But uh, one has to be intelligent enough to see that, that the, the symptom of a guru in, is given in Shastra is not that he's not that he has some institutional appointment, but that he speaks and acts according to Guru Sadhu. Uh, we should not be lazy in this regard and think that oh, someone's, someone's got the institutional imprimatur or the, the rubber stamp to, or the permission or whatever, authorization to act as a guru. Therefore, they must be a guru. Having said that, I'll finish and... Jisru Prasad, then you can all have a little break and come for the next seminar. So thank you all for listening. I know that uh, many of these topics, it requires some effort even to listen. It requires us to apply our intelligence to absorb this. Uh, but I pray that Srila Prabhupada can make me an instrument to help yourself and yourselves and myself in understanding better the process of Krishna consciousness so that we can uh, apply ourselves to it better and be benefited in progress on the path back to Krishna. Hare Krishna.